Okay, Nikki. All right, well, greetings and welcome everyone. I'm Nikichi Taifa, convener at the Justice Roundtable, and I co-chair with Angeline Afrasia and Dreesen Heath, the Racial Justice Working Group of the Justice Roundtable. One of the primary things that the Racial Justice Working Group wants to do is to bring um, uh, information to uh, uh, colleagues in the Justice Roundtable and uh, in the movement uh, as a whole. And Angeline Frazier is going to introduce our very esteemed guests that we have uh, this morning and this afternoon, depending on where in the country you are. Angeline uh, is the Executive Director of the National Network for Justice. Uh, prior to that, she uh, was a prime mover and shaker on state issues at the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, and she's worked in a number of other capacities before that in the justice uh, system. And just before I turn it over to her, I just want to say, people might have looked at the announcement and said, well, what does this have to do about criminal justice? Everything, everything, because we're going to hear from a woman, we're going to hear from a mother who used her resiliency as a result of being I impacted a family member, a dear family member impacted by the justice system and just how she utilized her resiliency uh, in terms of um, helping to cope with that. So Angeline Frazier Giles, Angeline Frazier Giles, okay, let me turn it over to you right now. Okay, thank you so much, Nikichi. And Nikichi knew me when I was Fraser and periodically she will just use Fraser, but she does know my husband and she knows that she has to say <laughs> Giles. So thank you all for being here today, in, uh, this afternoon in this space. We are so, so honored to have Ms. Karen Collins present to us today. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to introduce her and then I'm going to show uh, the short video about the project that she uh, engaged in uh, when she had a, a terrible thing happen to her in her life. And then we're gonna just, go into some dialogue and talk to her about where she is now, the space, how she came to create this uh, amazing, amazing project and, and where she sees herself going in the future because there will be a future trust. After you see this, you will be amazed and pleased and you'll want to do all you can to reach out to her and help her. And before I start with her bio, I just wanna say that I I'm of the age where I get the AARP magazine. And that is how I was introduced to Ms. Karen Collins because AARP had an article in one of their magazines. I get two, two separate magazines, but they had an article and they were talking about, um, the, in the article, they were, uh, it was describing how she started these uh, dioramas and uh, because of what she was going through. And I said, wow. So I started looking up her name and, then I found the museum and then I reached out to the guy who actually did the video. I found him and reached out to him. Tell you, you can find anybody. If you, if you can find anyone <laughs> if they have any social media presence. And he emailed me back with your email address. And then I contacted you and it's just been great. I've had a chance to talk to your husband and you guys are so cute together. Uh, I love you both. And so I will go ahead and just introduce I'm sorry, just uh, go through her bio and then I will start the video. So for more than 24 years, Compton-based folk artist Karen Collins is the founder and executive director of the African-American Miniature Museum. She's been creating a pictorial view of black history through dioramas placed in shadow boxes. From the very beginning of the journey, the middle passage to America up to Barack Obama and Kendrick Lamar, Karen's miniatures bring clarity and vibrance in the telling of black history. The mobile museum that began in, 19, in the 1990s when Karen took her work to schools, libraries, churches, and community centers as a way to bring both the many triumphs and the horrors of black history to a generation of children that sorely needed a sense of self and context. She has continued to work from her workshop at home alongside her husband who makes the wooden boxes she uses and has been exhibited at the Museum of Tolerance the Madam Walker Legacy Center in Indianapolis, the Jazz Museum at Lehman Park, and in libraries and schools throughout the Los Angeles area, including the 21's collection exhibit at the Los Angeles Central Library. So with that, I'm going to share my screen.
first of all, I never had a dollhouse as a child. We were really too poor. My mother, she raised us, five of us, by herself. But I knew how to make a dollhouse out of cardboard boxes. So I would make those for myself and my sisters to play with. I finally bought one when I was about 40. And I just loved the size and the scale of miniatures. I could decorate it, put down the carpet and the wallpaper and everything, and that was exciting. Uh, but then I'd had two children, my son and my daughter. I thought no person ever loved anybody as much as I loved my son. I really thought that. The last time I saw him then, when he was free, he was going with his father to be a size for his tuxedo for the prom. And when I got home, I got a call from him saying he was in jail. And um, I just, you know, fell apart. Just fell apart. And because he had a prior record then, uh -huh. When this bill is law, three strikes and you're out will be the law of the land. It will be used to put 100,000 police officers on the street. It will be used to build prisons to keep 100,000 violent criminals off the street. It will be used to give our young people something to say yes to. <laughs> He didn't deserve 167 years. He didn't kill anybody or anything like that. So why would you give him 167 years? When they killed Trayvon and Mike Brown, oh my God, when uh, Mike Brown's mother said, do you know how hard it is to bring a black child and let him graduate from high school? And that really hit me because I knew what she was talking about. That's a lot of work. You know, my son is still alive, but my, my part of me is in prison with him. Mm -hmm. I never know how they're gonna end up, you know. You, if they're sad, you have to give them a sad face. If they're laughing, you have to make them laugh. I was limp. I couldn't do anything. All I could do was think about my child not eating properly. Or He had never even been away from home. I had sent him to camp, but it just broke me down to my knees, I think, because I didn't raise him like that. So I, I stopped working. I just was very, very depressed and thinking what I should have done. And um, finally I thought, because I was an activist in the 60s, I thought I had told them things, but evidently not enough. So that gave me the idea to make the Black History Museum and go into the school and explain their lineage. We, they didn't come from weak people. They came from people that wanted a brighter future and suffered a lot to get to that point. So that's what I want to tell the young people. They don't have to join a gang or just be themselves. So none of this is sewn. I don't know how to sew, but we use tacky glue. And that is what's held all these exhibits together all these years. Tacky glue. What the media shows and what they choose to cover is oftentimes not flattering to young black men. 
And you can't tell me that doesn't affect them the way they think about themselves. So my job, I felt, was to tell them about where they came from, what the, our people had to go through to even be recognized as a human being. So we owe them a debt. We owe our ancestors a debt. A lot of times the kids aren't taught that at home and definitely not at school. So this was my contribution. That took my mind off of the situation with my son, especially in the beginning. I would just go without eating, bathing, everything, just into it. And that helped me and saved my life, I think. My husband, he designed these boxes and made sure it had glass on the top so the light could get in. I can cut, oh yeah! I can cut that down. Look at that! Yeah, if we cut had that it down. Yeah. He's telling me I'm gonna have to have you look that. Isn't that ugly? <laughs> <laughs> Say that to your wife. I have to have you look that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, if he was around you all the time, he'd be saying the same thing. <laughs> 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 Woo! He always wanted my success and the success of our work. So the dioramas wouldn't have any place to be if he didn't make the boxes. So he can whip them out like that as needed takes all the time. Because it it's a lot of work. This is my little part. I can't go to jail anymore. I've not marched. I don't want to do that anymore. But I will show them who they are, who their people were, and maybe that'll pick them up. I look at these kids, they need me just like he needed more of it. I like for them to be wherever they can be seen and appreciated. Nobody sees them here. And that's part of my dream for the future. In my mind, thinking about the future, we have a building that we can use and renovate. Um, where we still have the uh, museum expanded, and that I might have a creative room to work with children and teach them how to accomplish this craft. Maybe have a little library for children in there. It's a happy place, it's a safe place for families to spend time, because this is not a looky-loo where you can just look at it and go. You have to spend some time with your child so they will know the truth. Just a place where they can come and learn and have fun, uh, read. I just see something for the future. That would be just heavenly. Yeah. And I believe it's going to come, too. Yeah. We don't have a quarter, but it's going to come. Because mm. the children are in state. Yeah. Should we do the waltz? The waltz? Yes, you should do the waltz.
So thank you, Ms. Collins, for doing this. This is <clears throat> so, so beautiful. And I, I want to just uh, open it up by saying that I think you creating this art in the time that you were dealing with so much uh, stress and so much depression, it saved you, as you say, in the piece, but I think it's also gonna save a lot of people because you were able to throw yourself into this artwork and get to a place where you recognize your importance and the work that you've done and how that's gonna carry on. Uh, that is such a beautiful, beautiful piece. So I wanna allow Nikichi, if you have a, a question or a comment that you wanna make and, and you're still on mute. I'm sorry, I am just totally overwhelmed. I mean, that was just so phenomenally great. <laughs> you know, I'm just uh, curious, uh, Ms. Collins, um, what your son thinks about this? Has he had the opportunity? I mean, I don't know how that, how he could, but has he had the opportunity to see any of your work? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, he came home uh, after eight years. And I had started the museum and uh, he loved it. He absolutely loved it, but he went back to prison. And uh, that's when I started creating for the public. And I told him why. And in newspaper articles that his uh, crime would be talked about as a, an impetus for me to start this artwork. So he was in agreement. Uh, I wanted to make sure he was okay. I never used his name, uh, but the circumstance uh, I used and he was okay with that. He was happy. He wanted to reach young people. Can you um, tell us about uh, some of the entities or organizations or corporations or whatever that have reached out to you or that you're in collaboration with or academic institutions with respect to your work? Uh, until lately, none. <laughs> My husband and I financed it. We were uh, driven, I believe by God, to do what we did. Uh, in the last two years. I've gotten recognition and uh, all kind of different um, opportunities to create for money. So all of a sudden, I'm popular. That's why you see me now. But in the long haul, there was no recognition. It was just us. Um, if I asked someone, could I exhibit at their place of business. And they agreed that meant the world to me as an artist. Uh, but uh, basically it's me and my husband. Well, you are truly an, an, an artist, an <laughs> artist. <laughs> and I think I heard or read somewhere that the National Museum of African-American Culture <laughs> I hear in Washington, D.C., I think I heard, did I hear that they reached out to you? Well, if I didn't, maybe it's positive thinking for the future, but I thought I heard something in well, connection with this. there was a guy that uh, reached out to me from the Smithsonian. Right, that's and, what I'm talking about. Right, yeah. he read uh, his mother's AARP <laughs> and he wanted to talk to me and I went ahead and talked to him and. Uh, I said that at the end, I said, well, why did you, why did you want to do an interview with me? And he said, so I can tell other people. So I don't know what will become of that. But uh, if you're straightforward and I feel like you stand up, I don't have a problem with talking to people that I don't know. So 
I'm surprised that you heard that. I don't know if I told <laughs> Mrs. Giles about that. And I think she's back. Or um, Angeline, are you back? I know you were frozen for a minute. Okay, I see Ms. Collins, we have a question from the attendees, uh, a question from Sabrina Wood in the attendee section. She's asking, is there a 501c3 for this? Do you have a nonprofit um, status? No, I don't. And um, I'm really not a paperwork or a computer person. So it was just too much paperwork. Now, in the future, of course, uh, but I will have a staff by then that can handle uh, those types of things. The grants that I'm applying for are, you don't have to be a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's where I am now. We don't have a 501c3, but we do have people that read an article and want to give us uh, donations. And of course, we uh, gladly accept them. Um, so if anyone has other questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. We're waiting for Angeline Frazier Giles uh, for her techie issue to be resolved so that she can come back on uh, on screen. Um, Ms. Collins, I think I see your husband there. Does he yeah. want to join us and, and talk about his role as well? No, no, not today, not today. Okay, well, while you're doing, I see a uh, follow up from Sabrina Wood, who asked about a 501c3. She said, and she is an astute a CPA, she says, I am offering my services to get it done for you. You see that? You got Isn't a, that offer, something? a pro bono offer for uh, a <laughs> Thank 501c3. You, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and Angeline will be sure to make sure that she connects you with Sabrina Wood with respect to that. And that's absolutely, um, you know, phenomenal. Um, and she said that she will uh, be in touch. Um, I'm wondering, I'm hoping that Angeline might be able to just call in if her video, oh, she says, okay, if her video isn't um, working uh, right. Um, but while we're waiting on that, um, again, um, Ms. Collins, what, what do you see for the future with respect to your project? And I see Angela Frazier Giles is back, but I'll just ask that question. I'm now going to turn it back over into her very capable hands. So what do you see as the future of your project? Uh, as in the um, documentary, we need a stable building. People from all over the country and the world want to come and see the exhibit but I can't invite the public into schools and different things like that. So, and we are in our seventies now. We can't, my husband is not able to lift those boxes by himself. We would rent a truck and travel with it. So if we had a building where people could come and like I say, I could really engage with the children, uh, teach them the craft, um, where the parents can come in and sit down and really talk to them about our history. Uh, that would be my dream for the future. And Angeline, I think there's a question in the Q&A, but I'm going to turn yes. it over to you. So, uh, and this question is actually from my brother-in-law, <laughs> who is on the West Coast also. And his question was, how do you transport your dioramas without d damaging the artwork? And I think you guys were just discussing that uh, we had a little technical glitch. And so I got kicked off, which means that everyone who was on got kicked off. There was a, okay. there was a glitch, but uh, we're uh, still back on, we're back on recording. Um, and I think you were talking about that you're there now in storage, so you're not transporting them uh, into the not during space. the Not during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, Transporting them got to be too much mm -hmm. um, because it's the two of us plus yeah. grandchildren that needed to be picked up from school and, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what have you. Uh, the boxes are very, very well made mm -hmm. and they don't come apart for 24 years. They've been traveling and what have you. Every now and then something will come loose and we just uh, blew it back and yeah. keep on going. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Okay, there's another question. So do you do all the background drawings that are in the shadow boxes? I saw like there's a photo, uh, you had a photo of Barack Obama, you made that into a miniature, but all the other drawings, do you do that? No, I uh, actually get permission from artists to use their pictures oh, okay. in the shadow boxes. I uh, put our art that we would appreciate, African-American art, in the shadow boxes, pictures of uh, family members. And I might get that out of a magazine. Uh, we miniaturize some things and some things are already miniatures. So we just, mm -hmm. my husband will make a frame and put it around it. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. okay, very, very nice. And so uh, what was the last diorama that you created? Uh, well, the last one I'm creating right now, which is a commission piece on Black Cowboys. Uh, the one before that, I think the last one was, what was it, Eddie? Oh, Google. That Google. was my last. Um, Eddie's piece. trying to show us the, the Google one. <laughs> I don't think and that's the Greensboro sit-in. The Google yes, the committed. Greensboro 4. They uh, commissioned me to make a shadow box for their duel, which mm. they never had a picture of an actual 3D artwork for mm. a duel. Usually people make cartoons or something like that right. written. Uh -huh. But uh, they commissioned me to do that. They wanted someone that actually made things. I don't know where people get my name from. Uh, he called. The guy from Google, I thought somebody was playing a trick <laughs> on me or something. And um, when he commissioned me to do it, but he said he recently that actually made things and I came up. So he approached me. Okay. So you mentioned the Black Cowboys, someone commissioning you to do the Black Cowboys. And when we were speaking before, you mentioned Bass Reeves and I had just seen a a movie about Bass Reeves and my friend Sabrina is also like heavy into into cowboys and movies and all kind of stuff. So so when is that coming out and when will we be able to see that? Uh, we are working on it now. Um, our deadline is in August, but I'm trying to get it done before then. It's actually four boxes. Uh, the Compton Cowboys will be, uh, their mm -hmm. rodeo king mm -hmm. will be included. Uh, Bill Pickett and the Exodusters, which were African Americans freed from slavery that came to the West uh, in covered wagons and claimed their uh, uh, property, their land, and wow. joined already formed uh, cities uh, from African Americans. We're doing that. Do you happen to have a diorama uh, on the Tulsa Greenwood Massacre? This is their 100th, no. 100th anniversary commemoration of the massacre. I was just wondering. No, but I would like to do one on Black Wall Street. So okay. uh, I wouldn't, when I create like uh, the one on the Klan, our first shadow box, we had the Klan riding in town with torches and uh, everything. And the children that saw the exhibit, it was too violent for them. So mm -hmm. an actual massacre, I wouldn't depict. Mm -hmm. But something like uh, Black Wall Street, where I could actually show the businesses and the Blacks, you know, how they were dressed and what mm -hmm. have you, doing business with one another. That so it, it, it all has to do with uh, what you provide to the public and what will be understandable even to the young. Right. Uh, if someone wants to tell their children the uh, what actually happened, the violence, mm -hmm. then that's for the parent. Mm -hmm. But for, because my work affects so many age groups. I have to be sensitive to that. Right. So I redid the uh, clan where you had to think 
and it was an implicit. Uh, the Klan member was walking by with a rifle on his horse, and uh, the people were right there at the outhouse, and they saw him, and someone was in there, and they were doing like this. So the parent or whoever was lecturing could see the terror that we went through in those days. So, yeah, and okay. you explain it to the children or their parents or, you know, explain it to them. Yeah, no, that makes that makes sense. I, I appreciate that. Uh, and how many dioramas are there? Uh, we it, it's in and out. Um, right now we have like 52, 56 different dioramas on different aspects, time periods in black history. Mm -hmm. And do you have it cataloged? We don't have any of that, but we will in the future. <laughs> it's kind of, um, neither one of us are business people. So we did this because of a need uh, in desperation, really. Mm -hmm. And I haven't thought past that is mm -hmm. creating and getting it out to where it can be shared with the public. So maybe before I leave here, uh, we'll have, we will have accomplished that portion of it. Okay. All right. So that seems like there's, there's a need there. You need a volunteer to help you catalog. Yeah. Until the, uh, uh, money flows very yes. well, you know, to pay staff, mm -hmm. uh, it would have to be, uh, voluntary at first. Uh, right. Well, trust. We've, if, got, we've gotten quite a bit of uh, exposure. Yeah. And uh, for artists, that's everything. Right. You know, I've done so many free shows and what have you, uh, but it finally paid off. So uh, that's what we're, do what we're doing now. Okay. So Sabrina just posted in the chat. Oh my God, I'm a fine art major and a CPA. This is calling me. Now, this is actually folk art. It's folk art. Yes. And uh, folk art, if you know what it is, it is uh, usually people that are not educated in the arts. Uh, we create uh, reflecting our communities, our culture, and most of it is handmade. It might be a picture, uh, but I am a folk artist. I'm not a fine artist. Um, well, she says exactly. I, I'm folk self taught. Art, folk yes. art is a real thing, is the real yes. thing. Yes, <laughs> yes, it is. It is. Uh, but you know what? The general artist public don't respect us in that manner. Yeah. They, they tend to think it's a hobby. Oh, well. Yeah the work that you've put into this, the detail and the work that your husband has put into this, this was, this was work, right? This was, yeah, it was the labor work. of love. It was work. It was hard work. Yeah. Um, I totally respect it because I had to take a, a class when I was in, uh, in fashion school where I had to draw shoes and draw skirts and I have no artistic ability. So I could totally appreciate you working with your hands and clay and creating something that is so meaningful. So my hat's off to you. Thank Fine you. art, folk art, art, period. It's absolutely, yeah. absolutely incredible. So right. Nikichi, do you have anything else you want, you want to add? Um, I just have one more question. Um, Ms. Collins, I know you mentioned that uh, you were, or you, you had at one point, um, when talking to children, um, seeking to interest them in your craft in terms of how to do it. I'm just curious, have, do you have any understudies or um, uh, mentees that are uh, learning how you do what you do so that this tradition can carry on? Well, that is one of the main reasons for the building because this is hands-on and I can't have uh, children in my home. I don't want that. 
So if I had somewhere where we could sit down in a, a art class and, you know, I would have all the different, because it's pieces of this and pieces of that and you put it together. So that's when I would, and hopefully I can do it soon, uh, teach the children. Uh, because, and that's any race of children. Everybody has ancestors. Everybody has a history. So, you know, it would, uh, it would be very helpful, I think, for them. Mm -hmm. So if anyone else has any questions, please put them in the Q&A. But I want to ask um, Karen and maybe Eddie, if he wants to come and hop on the camera with you just what you see going forward. I know you talked about having a space, having a location to put all the dioramas, but outside of that, what do you, what is your hope? What is your wish for the, the art going forward or any, anything you haven't been commissioned for that you would love to be able to do or any, any dreams that you have of the future? I know that we've spoken about your son and uh, trying to, you know, you want him home because the sentence that he received was so harsh and you, you want him, you want him home. So any thoughts that you have about your future work or um, your son or anything that you want to share with us? Um, my son is number one, it's on my heart right now that, uh, when he first went in there, I couldn't look at young men his age. I couldn't, uh, I just couldn't accept it because it was such a shock to me. Uh, my husband and I were separated at the time, so I took them out of Los Angeles, which the gangs were really getting out of hand, and took them to Riverside. And I never dreamed he was in a gang. I just never did. They were home at 9 o'clock at night. I uh, had them work with me on jobs. Their summer jobs were always where I worked. So um, I forgot what was the question. <laughs> no, just I just want to know what your, what your thoughts are about. You, I mean, your son, as you said, is number one always in your, your thoughts. Uh, but moving forward, just you with the art, you with hoping that he's home. Do you want to see him help oh. start helping you? Like, what? Like, what do you? What do you see for the future? Yeah, uh, he really would be instrumental in this business and helping his dad. Uh, we need bodies to move this uh, exhibit if we are to continue with the uh, mobile aspect of it. He has good ideas. He's very intelligent. Uh, he's married right now to his childhood sweetheart. He got married inside the institution. And I just want him to live, to be able to live a normal life right now. Mm -hmm. uh, the promise that was destroyed when he went into prison is too much for parents to bear because you know, who was, who even thought their child would be uh, in this situation. So I want him out of there. That's my, my main thing. And, and he can, he can help us. He would be instrumental okay. in helping us. So there's another question in the chat. How do the children respond after they see your art? What kind of questions do they ask you? Well, what I do is the day before the exhibit in the schools, I go and train 15 students to be docents. And I and docents are those people that uh, show the public the uh, art. And uh, I take some boxes and tell them, let them know what they'll be doing. And so it's not just me presenting, it's actually the other students. Uh, that help me all day long. They eat lunch with me. And I give them uh, certificates afterwards. And we talk about how they could use that as volunteer if they're going to college or 
they need that as a reference for a job. So, um, yeah, the kids look at it like they're watching television. I mean, it really, yeah, sucks them in because you have to get in because it's so small. The, the dolls might be five inches. And so then they can see what's going on. And each box has information in it, so uh, they can read what they're looking at, and uh, the docents can tell them. And oh, they love. Okay, my husband. <laughs> we have uh, paperwork there. What I saw today, and the children. It was meant for them to write it down or draw pictures and take it home. But they leave it for me to tell me what they liked about the exhibit. I've had people write uh, poetry um, to show their appreciation. So I know it makes a difference. The teachers tell me that self-esteem is raised. We uh, want their scholars to help us, but we also take the students that might be having a problem in school. And they, the teachers tell me they see improvement. And the children in general are treated like uh, rock stars because they had that experience uh, and showed the whole school. We might have 700 kids come through there wow. in a day. Mm -hmm. So, um, so do, is there any one or a few in particular that, that really resonate with them? Um, well, the dollhouse, they love it. I have two dollhouses of black family uh, that they love. I also have a collection of private dolls given to me to the museum. And one of them is uh, uh, Tupac and Biggie together. Mm -hmm. And they're in front of a, a cemetery. And it has uh, them depicted saying, please stop the violence. So they love that, but I always make it over there and tell them, think how much they could have accomplished had it not been for gun violence. So it's a lesson, but they they just love them. I got Snoop Dogg, uh, he's a doll, you know, and uh, so they love things like that. Uh, I had to incorporate something that they could, um, they, they could, could relate to. Yes. Right. And uh, I have one on stereotypes, then and now. So they have to understand how stereotypes are believed and how they're created and how we were used. Uh, and a stereotypes is the reason why people think of us the way they do now. So uh, we talk about that as children because they want to know what well, why is why do they look why are their lips so big and the lips so big? and I tell them that's how that was advertising that was on uh, uh, cards and everything mm -hmm. that's how they sold some of their profit some of their products is to depict us as less than human so. Uh, you know, I talk to them about never, ever taking on that persona. Right. Because that's where stereotypes come from. Well, I just want to say again, thank you, thank you, thank you. I have another short video that I want to show. It's the video that Eddie sent me. Uh, news. You were on the news, the local news. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And I wanted to show that. Uh, and Nikita, if you have anything else, we will show that. And I want to thank everyone who uh, stayed with us. We did have some technical difficulties, but I think we're all back. And thank you for participating. And if you hold on just a second, I will share this. Okay.
sharing the wrong screen. Hold on. Museum schools throughout the day, children a taste of history. In tonight's People Difference Report, our passengers generate protein craft. It meant a lot to all of us. We went for everything, and it really was. The protests we're witnessing from Compton remembers fighting for change and equality as a teen in the late 60s, long before the hashtag Black Lives Matter. You could not, not do anything. You had to participate. It was in your soul. In 1974, Collins became a mother. She says despite instilling her son with strong values, he made a choice at the age of 18 that cost him a 167-year prison sentence, leaving her devastated and questioning her parenting. Okay, what could I have done? What didn't I do to influence this child that you didn't raise like that to turn that way. I put in different artifacts. Before she allowed herself to fall into depression, Collins channeled her grief into creating inspirational dioramas from clay, depicting African-American culture throughout history. That was my quest to create something I could go and share with children and adults alike. And for nearly three decades, Collins has been hauling 50 dioramas she keeps stored in her living room into schools throughout Los Angeles. The African American Miniature Museum fills children with an enormous sense of pride and curiosity. They'll stand there and look at it like it's television. Collins trains students to become docents, giving them the responsibility of teaching their peers about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Harriet Tubman, and Louis Armstrong, just to name a few. Oh my goodness. Last February, when Google asked Collins to recreate a diorama doodle to commemorate the 60th anniversary of the Greensboro Four lunch counter sit-in, she was honored. Last year, the downtown Central Library asked Collins to create a diorama in the theme of Black Lives Matter. And they're all holding up signs, Sandra Bland, no justice, no peace, Mike Brown. Recently, she added the name of George Floyd to the diorama and says she admires the determination of today's protesters made up of every race, creed, and culture. I'm feeling optimistic for the first time in a long time. And grateful for opportunities she's embraced to promote change. It's very fulfilling for me. I feel like, okay, maybe I am making a difference. And I just... So I just want to say that, yes, in fact, you are making a difference. And I thank you and Eddie again so much for participating with our conversation on justice today. And, you know, we will stay in touch. And I will actually, I'm sure there's a few people listening that want to get in touch with you and see how we can help you, not only with your son's case, but with also with just getting more people involved in uh, educating more people about what you're doing. So again, thank you so, so much. And thank all of you for participating and have a wonderful afternoon. And thank you. This was an honor for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.